There's no denying that humans are violent creatures. From domestic violence within the home to globe-spanning wars, our history has taught us that humans indeed do have a habit of acting on aggression. Where does this violent behavior come from? Are we hardwired with it, or do we learn this behavior? And is there any way to move beyond being a violent creature? Is this predisposition towards violence the reason why humans kill time and time again? The truth is that we don't have all the answers. Evolutionary psychologists might say that our prehistoric ancestors passed down a tendency toward violent behavior, particularly among males. But even if this is true, the full explanation is far more complicated. While violence may be part of our genetic history, so is contemplation. Perhaps what makes us even more remarkable is that we have this seemingly infinite capacity to achieve great things, and yet, our history is filled with violence towards one another. How can we dedicate countless hours to matters of art, science, and other sophisticated pursuits, and still commit acts of murder or wage globe-spanning wars? Interestingly enough, we are also told time and time again about how wrong killing is. Since the first moments we're able to comprehend sentences and gather sophisticated thought, we were always told killing is bad. Yet, a lot of places in the world, governments, tribes, communities, enact punishment by death to those who have ended a life. They kill people who kill. This punishment is what's known as the death penalty, and it has been around for centuries. Is this punishment justifiable, or are we better off without it? Do people who kill deserve a second chance, or does the punishment fit the crime? Capital punishment for murder, treason, arson, and rape was widely employed in ancient Greece. The Romans also used it for a wide range of offenses, though citizens were exempted for a short time during the Republic. It also has been sanctioned at one time or another by most of the world's major religions. Followers of Judaism and Christianity, for example, have claimed to find justification for capital punishment in the biblical passage, Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Yet, capital punishment has been prescribed for many crimes not involving loss of life, including adultery and blasphemy. The ancient legal principle, lex talionis, talion, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life, which appears in the Babylonian code of Hammurabi was invoked in some societies to ensure that capital punishment was not disproportionately applied. Death was formerly the penalty for a large number of offenses in England during the 17th and 18th centuries, but it was never applied as widely as the law provided. As in other countries, many offenders who committed capital crimes escaped the death penalty, either because juries or courts would not convict them or because they were pardoned, usually on condition that they agreed to banishment. Some were sentenced to the lesser punishment of transportation to and then American colonies and later to Australia. The death penalty in America is a flawed, expensive policy defined by bias and error. It targets the most vulnerable people in our society and corrupts the integrity of our criminal justice system. From police officers to family members of murder victims, Americans are recognizing that the death penalty does not make us safer. EGI provides legal assistance to people on death row, many of whom are innocent or wrongly convicted. We provide representation at trial, on appeal, and in post-conviction proceedings to people facing execution. We have documented widespread racial bias in the administration of the death penalty, and we challenge racial discrimination in jury selection, sentencing, and throughout the system. We protect vulnerable people facing execution, including people with mental illness who are uniquely at risk. And we provide reports about capital punishment and the ways in which public safety can be undermined by relying on this expensive and flawed punishment. In death penalty cases, perjury, false accusations, and official misconduct are the leading causes of wrongful convictions. A record 111 exonerations in 2018 involved witnesses who lied on the stand or falsely accused the defendant. 
In 50 of these cases, the defendant was falsely accused of a crime that never happened. Misconduct by police or prosecutors, or both, was involved in 79% of homicide exonerations in 2018. Concealing evidence that casts doubt on the defendant's guilt is the most common type of misconduct, which includes police officers threatening witnesses, forensic analysts faking test results, and prosecutors presenting false testimony. Official misconduct is more common in death penalty cases, especially if the defendant is black. Data shows that 87% of black exonerers who were sentenced to death were victims of official misconduct, compared to 67% of white death row exonerees. A person doesn't have to be innocent to be wrongly sentenced to death. The intense pressure to obtain a death sentence and the political stakes for police, prosecutors, and even judges can cause serious legal errors that contribute to wrongful convictions and death sentences. In Alabama alone, over 160 death sentences have been invalidated by state and federal courts, resulting in the conviction of a lesser offense or a lesser sentence on retrial. The death penalty is mostly imposed on poor people who cannot afford to hire an effective lawyer. The failure to provide adequate counsel to capital defendants and people sentenced to death is a defining feature of the American death penalty. Whether a defendant will be sentenced to death typically depends on the quality of his legal team more than any other factor. Some lawyers provide outstanding representation to capital defendants, but few defendants facing capital charges can afford to hire an attorney. So, they are appointed lawyers who are frequently overworked, underpaid, and inexperienced in trying death penalty cases. Capital cases are especially complex, time-intensive, and financially draining. Lawyers representing indigent capital defendants often face enormous caseloads, caps on fees, and a critical lack of resources for investigation and expert assistance. Too often they fail to adequately investigate cases, call witnesses, and challenge forensic evidence. Capital defense lawyers have slept through parts of trial, shown up in court intoxicated, or done no work to prepare for sentencing. Few states provide enough funding for capital defense counsel, and most death penalty states don't require lawyers to meet the minimum training and experience guidelines set by the American Bar Association. Inadequate defense lawyers contribute to wrongful convictions and death sentences, and by failing to object at trial, they make it even harder to correct errors on appeal. After that first appeal, there's no right to counsel. That leaves people sentenced to death with little hope for relief in post-conviction proceedings, where they have to present new evidence and navigate complicated procedural rules. People of color are more likely to be prosecuted for capital murder, sentenced to death and executed, especially if the victim in the case is white. In 1972, the Supreme Court struck down the death penalty because it looked too much like self-help, vigilante justice, and lynch law. If any basis can be discerned for the selection of these few to be sentenced to die, the court wrote in Furman v. Georgia, it is the constitutionally impermissible basis of race. Southern lawmakers accused the court of destroying our system of government and quickly passed new death penalty laws. There should be more hangings. Put more nooses on the gallows, proponents of Georgia's new law insisted. It wouldn't be too bad to hang some on the courthouse square and let those who would plunder and destroy see. The Supreme Court upheld Georgia's new death penalty statute in 1976, and racial bias in the death penalty persisted. The court considered statistical evidence presented in McCleskey v. Kemp showing that Georgia defendants were more than four times as likely to be sentenced to death if the murder victim was white than if the murder victim was black. The court accepted the data as accurate, but it refused to reverse the death sentence because it concluded that racial bias in sentencing is an inevitable part of our criminal justice system. Now, it's quite clear just how many people are against this punishment, especially considering how this sentence can be used in an abusive and unjust manner. However, there are still quite a few sectors of people who agree with this. Ernest Vandenhag, a professor of jurisprudence at Fordham University, who has studied the question of deterrence closely, wrote, 
Even though statistical demonstrations are not conclusive, and perhaps cannot be, capital punishment is likely to deter more than other punishments because people fear death more than anything else. They fear most death deliberately, inflicted by law and scheduled by the courts. Whatever people fear most is likely to deter most, hence the threat of the death penalty may deter some murderers who otherwise might not have been deterred. And surely the death penalty is the only penalty that could deter prisoners already serving a life sentence and tempted to kill a guard or offenders about to be arrested and facing a life sentence. Perhaps they would not be deterred, but they would certainly not be deterred by anything else. We owe all the protection we can give to law enforcers exposed to special risks. Finally, the death penalty certainly deters the murderer who is executed. Strictly speaking, this is a form of incapacitation, similar to the way a robber put in prison is prevented from robbing on the streets. Vicious murderers must be killed to prevent them from murdering again, either in prison or in society if they should get out. Both as a deterrent and as a form of permanent incapacitation, the death penalty helps to prevent future crime.